Lord, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity of, of being with you and to uh, gather around God's Word. <clears throat> I'm reminded this morning, as we've had these very precious times in the Word of God, <clears throat> and uh, your pastor has said we are not interested in what many would think of as extra-biblical revelation. God help us. But I was reminded of Dr. Criswell. Uh, he was a wonderful man of God. He's with the Lord now. But uh, he was the uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church in downtown Dallas in Texas. And he was there, I guess, for maybe 40 years. But when he went there as a younger man, <clears throat> he followed quite a prestigious preacher and uh, a topical preacher. And people used to come to hear him preach. He was very eloquent. They, uh, he attracted people for his preaching, eloquence, and ability. So <clears throat> when Dr. Criswell went there, he thought, well, maybe I ought to just um, continue like this man. He has a wonderful reputation. And so <clears throat> he began to preach topically, but it wasn't Criswell. And so after just a short while, he gave it up. And he said to the folk, listen, he says, I'm, I'm going to expound the word. And this morning, he said, we're going to start in Genesis 1. And what we don't finish this morning, we'll continue tonight. And uh, we'll continue next week. And we are just going to preach through the Bible. And uh, after the meeting, there were people who said, uh, oh, people are not going to come out just to a man who's just going to go from chapter to chapter through the Bible. He said, you'll have problems. And he said, we did have problems. Where to put the people? <laughs> and when I heard Criswell say this, he said, last uh, month, we received our 20,000th member. And he said, I, I'd, I'd go across from the church because it had grown to a large church, had wonderful facilities. He, he said, I'd go across the church after the meeting and uh, i just mingle with the folk and greet the folk. And Of course, there were folk, uh, you can imagine in 20,000 people, there were people who'd meet with others who had been in the church for many years, but they had never met. And so he said, I hear them greet one another. Hello, praise God. When did you come to the church? Oh, I came to the church in Leviticus. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, well, I, I came in the first book of Kings, you know. <laughs> and they knew just when they came to the church, according to the place where... Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Criswell was expounding the scriptures. He says, after 17 uh, years and eight months, we came to the last book of the Bible. I like that. <laughs> because we have nothing else but this word of God, which lives and abides forever. And it's a great privilege for me to have been invited to share God's Word with you over these few days. Turn with me again this morning, please, to Ephesians chapter 3. And the second part of uh, verse 19. As I share with you this morning on the measure of God's fullness in His church. Paul says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Here is Paul in prayer, praying for these Ephesian believers and praying that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You know, there's nothing superficial, nothing shallow, nothing merely novel about Paul's prayer. Somehow you see him just soaring to the throne. 
and everything is weighty and, and rich and full and deep. He has been praying about a real power. The, the power of the Holy Spirit within the inmost self, verse 16. And he's been praying about a real possession. Christ in permanent residency in the very center of our being, the heart, not the fleshly heart, the, the seat of being, the center of our very personality. Christ there, reigning. And, and, and then Paul prays with respect to a real perception of, of the love of Christ and what that will do for us. Now, we don't have the opportunity during these meetings to uh, expound on this, but I, I cannot pass it by without some comment. I, I, I think that in this prayer, Paul is seeking to convey to us something of the vitality of the Spirit's power and uh, of the, the, the victory of Christ's reign within us as believers. And then he, he cannot proceed without drawing our attention to the vastness of Christ's love for us. Oh, I'm praying, he said in verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height and breadth and depth and, and length and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. He, he draws our attention just in these few strokes of his inspired pen with the dimensions of Christ's love. He's taken up with the magnitude of it. In so, much, in so much, friends, and no matter how much we think that we know of that love, we have to acknowledge that, that there are always inexhaustible oceans still to be tapped. You know, when we say, oh yes, we know that God loves us, it can be so trite. This is not what Paul is talking about here. It's not simply, well, listen, I want you uh, to know that, that God loves you. Well, we know that God loves us. But there's something here that Paul is drawing our attention to that we might know by a revelation of the Spirit something of the nature of this love, the sense of it, the, the, the expression of it, the, the object of it the achievements of it, the very impact of this love of God, this love of Christ within us. Oh, hallelujah. To know the love of God which is beyond knowledge. One is reminded, I was, as I was meditating of the incredible words of that nameless saint of old written on the walls of his prison cell regarding the love of God interned for Christ's sake. <laughs> but like John on Patmos, you can take him away from the church, but you can't take him away from his God. You don't shut him away from God. You shut him in with God. <laughs> and he, he wrote that marvelous song, words which became a great gospel song. Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? and every man a scribe by trade. 
to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. Oh, the immensity of God's love. How immense is this love of Christ. Oh, how intense is this love of Christ. Intensity that's measured by sacrifice and sufferings that we uh, read of this morning and caused our Lord to say, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. The, the fullness of that love of Christ for us. He's prepared to lay that life down for us. In John 15 and verse 13, Jesus himself said that greater love has no man than this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In 1 John 3 and verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. How invaluable is his love. I, I was reading in the Song of Solomon and came upon this verse that struck me Set me as a seal, chapter 8 if you're wanting to follow it, in verses 6 and 7. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The calls thereof are calls of fire. Love is a fire, a burning fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Waters, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. Listen, if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. There's something about true love, and, and especially, of course, as we think of the love of God, because we have love in all its grandest perfection in God. And how infinite is this love of God? Here in Ephesians, notice in chapter 2 and, and verse 4, you may have to turn back a page. <laughs> But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And this morning to know that you and I are central to that love. We need to appreciate this. To have some measure of comprehension of what Paul is declaring as a passionate desire for his God's people. Because, friends, we need to know that we are central to that love. Do you know this morning, I feel as though there's nobody else on earth. I'm the only one on this planet. And all the love of God is centered on me. God's not sharing out his love. <laughs> All his love is focused on me. And you. And you. And you. And you. And you. Praise the Lord. You, you need to know this, friends. In fact, Paul in Romans 8, he, he tells us uh, that... that uh, we have been justified by faith. And there is this grace in which we stand. And he says we, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen, Paul. Yeah, 
We are with you all the way. Until he goes on to say, we rejoice in tribulations also. <laughs> hey, Paul, now that's going to be too far. <laughs> we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Mark it. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And he says, we rejoice in tribulations also. Why do we rejoice in tribulations? Because we know something. What do we know? What Paul knew. He says, we know that tribulation works not against us, but for us. Tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, experience, hope. So tribulations do not militate against the hope. It promotes the hope. So cheer up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Someone asked me, you know, tell us a little bit more about Leonard Ravenhill. Well, we have, didn't feel it necessary to, to be reminded of some of the things of Ren Leonard Ravenhill. But I tell you, the last time I heard him preach many years ago in the valleys of Wales. <laughs> he said, you know, these people who go around saying, oh, you know, the devil's been after me. <laughs> oh, have had a terrible week. The devil's been after me. He said, you know, I don't think the devil knows them. <laughs> he said, they do nothing for the kingdom of God. <laughs> but tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope. And hope never maketh, hope is never ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts. Now, please notice that. It's not talking about being shared abroad from the heart. Oh, yes, that has its place. But Paul is not talking about the love of God being shed abroad from the heart. He says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. I'm so aware of God and his love for me. The totality of his love is toward me. He will never allow anything to touch me that is going to be detrimental to me, my spiritual and eternal welfare. So anything he allows is not going to, to uh, adversely affect my hope. It's going to, pr pr to, to uh, enhance the hope. Praise the Lord. It's going to promote the hope. Because I know that he loves me with such a love. The love of, of, of God will always be vast. And you and I will always be central to the attraction of that love. Hallelujah. You know, friends, uh, God didn't just say, I I'm going to create a universe and, and flung all those stars into orbit and all those planets and galaxies of them. And, and then said, now, um, there's one there. I think I'll put some people on that. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, before there was a universe, he created the earth. He created the, this is special. This is on all his great redemptive love and, and purposes. Here he is. He, he creates the earth. And then he flung into orbit all the stars as lights and the sun and the moon. Because, friends, 
here is something in the, 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 the purpose of God and in the heart of God that maybe we do not fully comprehend. And he has made the earth. And he has created man upon that earth. And he has done so for himself and for his glory. And everything exists for this. It's incredible, isn't it? And to know this morning that vast as that, that universe is, before there was that vast universe, there was God. He is vaster than this vast universe. This vast universe is contained within a vaster God. Now, this blows our mind. We, we can't comprehend this. This is why Paul is saying, when we talk about God and in these dimensions of infinity, <laughs> it, it's, 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 it, we cannot comprehend it. When he writes the, the Corinthians, he says, we see through a glass darkly. <laughs> That's why, friends, in my morning devotions, I trust it will be with you as too. Because this book of ours, this book, yes, it's ours now, this marvelous revelation that God has given, it's God's self-revelation. If you want to know anything about God, come to this book. Have you heard those people say, you know, what I think God is like, what do you mean think God is like? Unless God reveals himself, friends, we are blind and ignorant. It's what Tozer talks about as, as idolatry of the mind. Conceiving some kind of a God. No, God has revealed himself. And so what I do, I, I open this word and say, God, just take that veil back a little bit more. <laughs> Give me more of a glimpse of yourself, of your glory. So I look for him. The amazing thing is, when I see him, I've forgotten all about those problems I had. <laughs> because they are, they, are, they are all caught up in him. And I know all things are going to be well. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We need, friends, I tell you, we need more God-entranced preaching that our people go away from our gatherings with a greater and more majestic view of God, the God revealed here, because that is going to assist them tomorrow morning and the next morning when they're facing all the various conflicts of life and the circumstances and the situations that are not pleasant, but they've seen God. <laughs> Paul is praying, oh God, let them see you. <laughs> and in this particular dimension of his, his infinite love. And not only the dimension of it, but the duration of it. For his love, friends, is from everlasting to everlasting. God's love is as, as lasting as it is ancient. Uh, the hymnist has it right. He speaks of whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. There's nothing deeper to undermine it. There is nothing higher to supersede or overthrow it. There is nothing broader to restrict it. There is nothing longer to prevent it. This, this love of God. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Although they are familiar words, I'm sure to so many of you. In chapter 8 and from verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. 
For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But, but now this incredible final element of, of Paul's prayer. It seems to eclipse everything else. It's breathtaking. It's, it's awesome to, to contemplate. And yet the privilege of all who are in such a loving relationship of, with, to God in Christ. He says, I'm praying that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I, I tell you, this is gigantic. Can we envisage anything that's higher or greater than this? If this prayer of Paul's is a prayer for power, then all that he has mentioned, there's the inner reinforcement of the Holy Spirit in verse 16. There's that intimate relationship of Christ in verse 17. There is this incomparable revelation of divine love in verse 18 and part of verse 19. And then this, the greatest expression and experience that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, the immense repletion of God God himself. Notice this verse in the Amplified Bible uh, rendering of it. That you may be filled through all your being unto all the fullness of God. That is, may have the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body filled and flooded with God. God himself. This is awesome. I think that word awesome has been used today in, in, in such a, a way. It really, that awesomeness, that awe, must be reserved for God. You know? Oh, it was an awesome football game. Oh, we had an awesome meal. In that restaurant. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything, everything is all awesome. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. God is awesome. It's before him that we bow in, in loving reverence and adoring, uh, adoring love. You can see how that we must view salvation, friends, as being far more than freedom from sin. Thank God for forgiveness of sins. We had communion this morning. We broke bread. The body which was broken for us, the, 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 the cup representing the blood that was shed for us, all just symbolic. But meaning so much to us. And thank God we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins. But salvation, friends, is more than forgiveness. That, in a sense, that's, a, that's something negative. That's what you get rid of. That's what you're relieved of, your sin burden. We're talking about salvation where you just are not relieved of something, but where you receive something. And so John says, uh, Jesus, speaking of him as the word that became flesh, he said, he came unto his own, his own received him not, but unto as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So salvation, friends, is, is more than just forgiveness, uh, of sins, freedom from sin, or freedom even from Satan's bondage. And thank God for that. Colossians 1, uh, 12, 13 tells us that we give thanks unto the Father who has made us 
to, to participate in a marvelous inheritance belonging to those who are saints. Can I pause here? Saints. Saints. The other day, the Roman Catholic head of their church blasphemously called the Vicar of Christ. You know, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church has such false doctrine attached to it. And uh, they, they, they would want, in fact, you, you, you are not a church as far as they are concerned. Just a couple of years ago, just a year ago, the present Pope, he once again put out a statement from the Vatican, which he had already put out in the year 2000 before he became the Pope, saying that they were the only church, that Christ only has one church, that's the Roman Catholic Church, because only they have apostolic succession. <laughs> and so, of course, the point I was going to make was he, he was here and everybody was waiting for him to make Mary McCullough a saint. When I was in Rome at one time, a dear friend of mine, he was a student in the college where I used to lecture in the UK, and he took me uh, to this um, monument to uh, those who had fallen during the war. And, and we went to the top of this, and he looked over, and he saw, he, he looked at this church. He said, see that church? There is a Catholic church. He said, in there they have some bodies that are embalmed. In the process of canonization, uh, they have to be dead 25 years uh, before they can be made saints. And of course, Mary McKillop, they are trying to find this second miracle. Let me say here this morning, friends, sainthood is not the reward at the end of the Christian career. It's a bestowment at the beginning of it. I'm in the presence of saints this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever others are calling you. <laughs> you are saints. You are saints. And thank God, this inheritance that belongs to the saints in light. And, and Paul goes on to say, for, for he has translated us, he has transferred us out from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And that's wonderful, isn't it? But glorious as these truths are, and necessary, necessary as they are to be understood, here is something vaster. It's so positive. It's not simply what we have been brought out from, but what we have been brought un into. So look at this with me for a few moments, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. The, the expectation here is personal, that you might be filled. How condescending of God. In chapter 2, uh, we are given this solemn portrait of you and me in our prior unregenerate condition before him in those opening verses. Dead in trespasses and sins. Walking according to the course of this world. Carnal and licentious. The children of wrath. Without Christ. Aliens and strangers. Destitute of hope and of God. We are far off and truly, says Paul, at enmity with God. It's a miraculous thing, friends, that you are here worshiping God this morning. It's not because suddenly you thought, well, I, I think I'll seek after God. 
No, you had no thought of God. This is what the Bible says. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeketh after God. So if this morning we, have, we came to a place where we did seek him, he put the impulse inside of us to seek him. And thank God, friends, for the mighty work that he has done. Thank God that he looked upon us in mercy, loved us unconditionally. Thank God that he provided for our complete recovery and redemption. And now each of us, as believers... We can know the glory of this for which Paul is praying to be filled with all the fullness of God. We are now receptacles of his divine indwelling. You, you, you. Turn back to uh, John chapter 14 and verse 17. Jesus says, the Father is going to give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Listen, but you know him. And this incredible word of Christ, he dwells with you and he shall be in you. The with-dwelling spirit and the indwelling spirit. In the Old Testament, he was with his saints. He came upon them at times. He moved them. But now, friends, it's not the, just the fact that he is with us. He is in us. And... and this is incredible, isn't it, that the, the redeemed and renewed heart has a capacity to receive the things of God. In John 1 and verse 16, uh, John says, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, grace upon grace, abounding grace. And it grieves me, and I, I feel it must also and more so grieve the Holy Spirit to see professing believers who never seem to progress, who never seem to develop in their Christian lives, who do not seem to have life and, and, and never pursue what God has purposed and provided for them. They appear to know nothing of these loftier aspects of Christian possibility in God. And sadly, they never seem to manifest any real desire for such. There's something wrong. I was reminded as I was waiting on the Lord earlier this morning of Abraham. <laughs> the other day, there was a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses that came to our door. I, I don't normally waste my time. But they were a nice couple. They come from New Zealand on a holiday, and during their holiday, they were going from door to door. On a holiday. Hello. On a holiday. And out there, from door to door, witnessing to their false faith. I had quite a, an extraordinary time talking to them. And getting down to the nitty-gritty of the gospel with them. I won't go into the detail. But they said, you see, they said, um, you, you, you have taken Jehovah out of your Bible. I said, I haven't taken him out of my Bible. They said, well, well yeah, the, the Christians have taken uh, the, Jehovah out of the Bible. I said, no. And I said, furthermore, I said, God did not just reveal himself through his name Jehovah. I said, there are many other names, apart from the Jehovistic titles. I said, there's the other. In fact, I said, and I come, what I was going to come to was with Abraham. I said, when God appeared to Abraham, he didn't reveal himself as Jehovah. I said, but as El Shaddai. And she said, what? <laughs> I said, El Shaddai. She said, oh, I haven't heard of that. 
She did say, I'll have to go and, you know, search that out. And I, I trust they will and come to light. I said, you know, it's El Shaddai. Apart from the other names of El Elyon and El Olam and so forth, I, I, I just mentioned these two as to know that, listen, it's not just Jehovah because they are wrapped up in just this name. I said, he, he has revealed himself through many of his names. And here is Abraham. And God says, Abraham, listen to it. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. You'll find it in Genesis chapter 17 in the first verse. Walk before me and be thou perfect. <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> the, the wonderful thing is that before he says that, he says, Abraham, I am El Shaddai. He gave him a revelation of himself. Now he says, walk before me and be thou perfect. Because El Shaddai, it's the, we, we translate it as the almighty. El is that word for power. Shaddai comes from a Hebrew root, shad or shed, which means breast. It's the breasted one. Now, f forget about the goddess Diana and all this business with pagan ideas of their gods. Forget about all of that. And don't try to think now, friends, in terms of a feminine god. <laughs> yeah, all this crazy stuff going on in the church these days. <sighs> oh, the Lord help us. <laughs> <laughs> the breasted one. God is giving to him a revelation of himself. And this is the way that it is, he is able to express it when he says, walk before me. We've got a lot of, how many here are mothers? Don't be afraid to uh, <laughs> declare your identity. You're a mother? What about fathers? Amen. What about grandfathers? Well, it's coming down a bit now. Uh, <laughs> great grandfathers. What? Oh, there's someone to join me. <laughs> the mother and the father. That little child that has been born. I mean, when I was younger, you know, mother would be in bed for a couple of weeks after birth. Today they're up and out the next day. It's a different world, isn't it? We won't go into that. <laughs> but, um, you know, Mary doesn't say to George, George, listen, I haven't got time and opportunity to, to, uh, to make a meal, really. I'm so busy with the baby. But well, just pop around to the fish and chip shop and get the baby some fish and chips. Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to prepare dinner, you know, give the baby some steak. Uh-uh. When it comes to feed time, and the baby knows when to ask for it too, she takes that baby and puts baby to her breast. And, oh, it's a beautiful sound, isn't it? As baby just receives from mother that which has everything in it to sustain life and to nurture it. And, and no, the baby is not on steak. The baby is not on fish and chips. Not on tortellini. <laughs> Just on mother's milk. And, and day by day, one sees this incredible development in the child. Until it comes to a time when the child is beginning to draw itself up. It seems as though 
mother has a measure of omnipotence <laughs> that she can impart everything to that child that makes for that child's life and, and nourishment and to become strong and develop. And all the child does is <clears throat> draw from mother's breast. And then one day, the baby is standing. And you cruel fathers, you, you have the baby and you have them stand. And you, you'll stand there, you want them to walk. Come on. And this child gives a step. What do you do? You go back and back. <laughs> oh, that's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> they think one step, they're going to be in your arms. And, and your arms are not there because you've... you've re receded a little, a, a little way. What's happening? Walk before me. And then before you know it, that child is walking. It's maturing. That's that word perfect. Mature. And what God is saying to Abraham is, Abraham, I want you to walk before me. I want you to, to, to do my will. There's much that I have for you. And I want you to mature in your understanding of me. And, and, and here, in just a nutshell, he, 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 he expresses so much. And he says, listen, the ability for all of that is found in me. El Shaddai. Oh, praise the Lord. So that you and I this morning, this, this expectation is something that must be very personal to us. That we can, we can enter into such a closeness of relationship with God and drawing from His fullness that we also are entering into incredible divine experiences that we know that we are not of this world. We are in it, we are not of it. We are touching things that are infinite. We are getting to know God, God, for who he is. And enabled to do his will. The extent, of course, is profound. The extent is profound. Filled with all the fullness of God. Now, notice the word that Paul uses here. It's a word, pleruo, which means to... To, to level up as a hollow or to cram as a net that's full of fishes. You couldn't have another in there. It, it conveys the idea of completeness. It, it's a word that could either mean to fill up an empty thing or to complete an incomplete thing. So you have uh, Paul in Colossians 2 and verses 9 and 10. He says that in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him. God wants to fill us with himself. And I have time to go back to the Old Testament references in uh, Exodus 40 and 1 Kings 8. But whether it was the tabernacle or the temple, the, the, the place was filled with that Shekinah glory of his presence. And just as the Shekinah of his presence and glory of his person filled those Old Testament places, so we whose bodies now are the temples of the Holy Spirit can be filled with him. Now, it is important for us to qualify what is meant here when Paul prays that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled with. With. In the previous verses, as we have seen, that the love of God cannot be measured. It's an inexhaustible ocean. It speaks of that infinitude of, of, of God's nature and being. It's boundless. It's immeasurable. It's limitless. That is God. 
And there is nothing conceivable beyond God. We, we, we speak of the infinity of God, which means that he cannot be limited in any of his glorious attributes. Whether we think of God's power, or his holiness, or his love, or his wisdom, or his knowledge. And neither can he be restricted to time or space. As we said earlier, God is vaster than the universe that he created. Now, don't think in terms of that physically, please. Something that we cannot really comprehend with our finite minds. We are dealing with one who is eternal in his being. The one who outdistances and he, he overreaches time. He neither has beginning nor ending. Now, we can't take that in. And of course, now what is related to our very thoughts, he cannot be confined to any space. He transcends all spatial limitations. And so in 1 Kings and verse 8, Solomon says, what, me? Build a house for God? Why, the heaven of the heavens can't contain him. See, so when I talk about God's, the vastness of God, you know, it's, here it is. It's, it's in Scripture. The heaven of the heavens cannot contain him. And there are many other Scriptures. There's a marvelous passage in Psalm 139 which deals with a number of the attributes of God, and one of them is his, his omnipresence. No, in the Old Testament, friends, there's the upper Sheol and the lower Sheol. The upper Sheol. That's where the disembodied spirits of the just were. <laughs> and there's the lower most hell, of course. That's the place of the wicked dead. Uh, that's that's a, a marvelous subject on its own. What we're needing to understand. But he says... Uh, you know, you, you cannot go anywhere, but, but, but God is there. And God is not like atmosphere, friends. All this blasphemous thing of the force. God is not abstract energy. He doesn't fill the universe like, like uh, air. God is a person. Hello. Hello. God is a person, a real person. And here's the miracle of omnipresence. He is present everywhere at one and the same time and with his whole being. It's not a part of God that's with us this morning. Some wisp of divine atmosphere that has just come in here. <laughs> no, God is here with his whole being. And if I was to get on my mobile phone and just get on to my wife, yeah, they might have been out of the meeting now. I wouldn't disturb the meeting. Mobile phones. Uh, may I, I, I just throw this out? Uh, I don't mean throw the mobile out. Uh, <laughs> let me throw this out. Switch it off. But if you forget to switch it off, please get a ringtone that helps with the atmosphere. I've got the hallelujah chorus on mine. <laughs> so if I hadn't switched it off, at least it would contribute to the worship, you see. <laughs> 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 That's just beside the point. <laughs> but if I was to contact my wife now, and I say, you know, God is with us. She said, yes, he's with us too. And if I was to phone my lovely family back in Wales who all love the Lord, 
And they'd be there in that meeting, not nowadays, because they're nine hours behind us. I would say, your, your God is with us. I'm in Frankston. And we've got these meetings, and God is what they say. God is with us too. And when you were in Macau, God was with you. Not a part of God, all of God. God in his... Now see, this is the miracle of omnipresence. We, we can't take this in. And that's why I said the other night, you see, the devil's not omnipresent. <clears throat> see, these are attributes that are non-communicable. No one but God is omnipresent. No one but God is omnipotent. The devil does not have all power. And he is not omniscient. He does not know what is going to take place tomorrow. Only God is omniscient, having the knowledge of, complete knowledge of all things past, present, and future. He comprehends the total sum of all knowledge in all ages. He knows it instantly. He knows it uh, simultaneously. God never learns. I know you try to teach him sometimes. <laughs> yeah, you think you know better than God. No, but, but God is omniscient. No, the devil's not omniscient. In fact, he's very foolish. He's not wise. Wise in many things as we understand a certain kind of wisdom, but how foolish to, to forsake his position there as the covering cherub in that eternal throne and they be cast out from God and from his heaven of heavens, that throne, into the lower heavenlies where he is now. And later, friends, and it may well be soon because things are happening so rapidly now in end-time events, he will be cast down to the earth with great wrath. And then, <laughs> praise the Lord, he will be taken with one angel. One angel will take him. This one is not omnipotent. One angel will take him and put him in the abyss, the bottomless pit. For 1,000 years, he will be there, unable to fulfill anything of his devious evil works. And then he'll be loosed for a season and then he'll be cast down into that lake of fire. It's down, 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 down. That's where sin always takes you. Down, 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 down. But grace brings you up, 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 up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He is not omniscient. He does not know. See, all this thing of clairvoyance and all the rest of his Friends, it's all fraudulent. It's counterfeit. And what he does is to make things happen. It's not that he knows. He brings to pass what he says he's going to do. And people get all taken in by this. Up on the Sunshine Coast, every year now, we have this, uh, this seminar. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an exposition, an expo. It's the Psychic Expo. And you know, the ones who advertise this on the television are young girls in their mid, later teens advertising this expo, this psychic expo. All such a delusion of the devil. Our God. Uh, how, how can we find words to express the greatness, the grandeur, the majesty, the magnificence of, the, of this God. And how we need to see him revealed as he reveals himself. So we can say that God cannot be contracted to the span of a human heart. For logically the finite cannot contain the infinite so when it says, filled with all the fullness, we've got to qualify that. And it comes in our exegesis of the passage and of the scripture itself, because the, the preposition that's used there indicates a, a motion to an object with the purpose of touching it. So it's, it's being filled unto the fullness of God. We might say it implies being plunged 
into God's fullness and being filled therefrom. Come back to the family again, mom and dad, and that little child that's grown up now. At least sufficient to enjoy time down on the beach. Does it get warm down here? <laughs> to go to the beach? <laughs> you know, you can go skiing in Canberra, take a two-hour flight, and you can go bathing just five minutes from where I live. It's an incredible country, this, isn't it? Yeah, marvelous. We write one diary for me. And so this little family go down to the beach, and Dad loves to get down, and he's going to make this sand castle. And it's, it's oh, so for real. It's, it's marvelous, and he's going to have a moat going around it, but he needs water. So he says to little Charlie, he says, listen, just go down to the ocean and get, here's the bucket, fill it up. And so the boy goes down and he fills it, he comes, he doesn't want to spill a drop. <laughs> and he's got that little bucket full of the ocean. No, not the vast, immeasurable expanse of ocean all contained in there, but all that is in there is the ocean. And I can't contain this vast, infinitely vast God in this house of clay. But the possibility of this house of clay being filled with that which fills him so all that fills me is God, full of God. I like meeting people who are full of God, <laughs> who are full of Jesus, who just ooze him. I must admit, there are some, uh, I, I, I don't like to be unkind, and sometimes out of kindness I, I'll stop to say hello, but sometimes I, I, I don't feel I want to stop and say hello because I know that they are supposed to be Christians, but they're going to fill my ears with all kinds of stuff. And they are not living as Christians should live. <laughs> but, oh, to be filled with God. And this, of course, is progressive, and it's increasing. So I can take in the fullness of God to the measure only of my self-containment, the measure to which we are filled up with God is determined by the measure to which we are safeguarded from other things. There are some folk who are not full of God. They, they are Christians, but they're not full of God because they are so worldly. The emptying of self is realized in that faith that forsakes all all self-confidence and self-righteousness and self-dependence and self-pleasing and self-assertion. Yes, anything that allows self to control so that we are totally yielded up to God and coming to Him and touching the infinite, He fills us with Himself. I must conclude. How can I have more of God? Well, it's by being emptied of everything else and praying for an increased capacity. Like Jabez in 1 Chronicles 4 and verse 10. He says, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my costs. You need to be praying that, friends. Because here is the essence that's profound the fullness of God, to be filled, as one translates it, uh, to, the to the full with God himself, with all the completion God gives, uh, has to give to us. To help us appreciate this, uh, we, we need to see those scriptures as in Colossians 1.19. It pleased the Father that in him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell. 
In chapter 2 and verse 19, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And, and, and from that, without the time to, to expound it more, but Paul leaves us in no doubt that all the fullness of deity completely fills our Lord Jesus. All that God is, Jesus is. That's what he's teaching us there. Even though he has assumed human form and likeness and taken human nature, yet here is one who is none less than God manifest in the flesh. Praise his name. Praise his name. And, and, and it's only he can claim that. Only he can claim that. Because he's God. And all this false teaching, friends, about we are gods is blasphemous. Listen, we never will be gods. In fact... <clears throat> We never will be angels. <laughs> we are the sons of God. Yeah. Redeemed by his precious blood. And so, <clears throat> in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then he goes on, and we are complete. We are filled up out from him. Which, which makes for God-likeness or godliness. So what we see in God should be seen in us. And I think one of the most stupendous scriptures in the New Testament is in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and is it verse 4, where Peter says that through these exceeding precious promises of the gospel, we have be, been made partakers of the divine nature. Isn't that incredible? So let's be gone, friends, with all our excuses for the shoddy, low level of living as professed Christians. Say, well, you know, I'm only human. And I, uh, until Jesus comes, I can expect to, to, to fail and to fall and, you know. No. Reigning in life by one Christ Jesus. Partaker of the divine nature. Hallelujah. So that love in all its infinite perfection that's in God, yeah, still manifest in my life. That holiness in all its infinite perfection in God made manifest in my life. God's righteousness, God's justice, God's mercy take all the attributes natural and moral, take all those attributes of God. And oh, this morning, to see something of God's moral nature manifested in us because we are filled with God. He makes us complete. So God is seen in us. And if God is seen in us, friends, then God will be glorified in us in his church. And I trust this morning that we shall go on to know God in an ever-increasing fullness in our experiences until that day will dawn when he will have brought us to completion, when he will have finished what he has begun in us and forever we will delight in the wonderful presence of God and of his Christ, to behold him then in ways that we have never dreamed of. <clears throat> Let me tell you something, shall I? When you and I get to heaven, we're not going to be sitting on clouds playing harps <laughs> or guitars. <clears throat> no. In Revelation chapter 5, there is, it tells us, or chapter 4, there are seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, there are not seven different distinct spirits. 
There's only one blessed Holy Spirit. And so that is representing him in his, uh, in his sevenfold perfection. And as lamps of fire, it's for illumination. And friends, he is not only the one now to guide me into all truth, the one who reveals Christ to me, the one who enlightens my mind and heart concerning divine things. He will ever be before that throne because that's where we are in chapter 4. We are before the throne now. We are in that day to come when Christ has received us unto himself. John says, I was in the Spirit and the Lord. I heard his voice saying, come up hither. And very soon, very soon we're going to hear that voice. Come up hither. And we are going. We are going. We are going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like a dear friend, he was a very eccentric kind of a guy, but he got up in a meeting where I was speaking at at a convention with hundreds of people, and he began to extol God. He he ran out of superlatives, and he said, Oh, God, we're like ducks honking for home. (laughs) We want him to come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. And when we are with him, friends, that blessed Holy Spirit who was working for the Father and the Son as the executive of the Godhead, fulfilling all this marvelous work of bringing together his elect, the church. He will have that church with him. And does the Holy Spirit say, well, now I've finished. Now, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. I believe that heaven and eternity is going to be that non-ending exploration, excursions into the vast depths of God. This ever-increasing knowledge of God. And because He is infinite, then it takes eternity to get to know Him in any measure. Hallelujah. You know, any, any little knowledge that I have now, it's not even scratching the surface. God is going to have us with him. Those whom he saved, strengthened by his spirit, in whom his son has dwelt as Lord and King, in whom he was pleased to to fill us with himself during this pilgrimage journey. But then forever and forever, he is going to reveal himself in his glory to his church. She is glorious. He is all glorious. It's going to be exciting. I want to go home. (laughs) Some of you... I mean, the very older ones, like Len Goldstraw and his wife, Jan. Who <laughs> remember dear Philip Duncan. He was one of the Pentecostal pioneers here in Australia. Wonderful man of God. Pastored church he pioneered in, in Sydney, in Petersham, for many, many, many years. Maybe close on to 60 years. Then he retired. He was 90 years old when he went to be with the Lord. And his son, a son-in-law actually, had invited him to speak one Sunday morning. And he preached as he always preached, with fervor and passion and a deep understanding of the Word and of God and blessed the people. And when he had finished, he said, stand, let's worship the Lord, and began to sing about, you know, worshiping God there between the cherubim. And he went to heaven. He just went. He was with them. Of course, this house of clay just fell to the floor, and obviously there was a rush of people uh, to him. And they sent for the paramedics. And the paramedics came and they they started to open his shirt and they they wanted to 
work on him. And dear Molly, Philip Duncan's wife, said, leave him alone. He is with the Lord. He wouldn't want to come back. <laughs> Friends, we're going home. And we won't want to come back with him forever. And I'm looking forward to those excursions as the Holy Spirit, our eternal instructor, takes us into the deeps of God. Only he can do it. 1 Corinthians 2, only he can do it. The sad thing is, and, and bear just one minute, the sad thing is there are churches and there are people who are like those in Thyatira who had known the depths of Satan. Friends, I don't want myself to know anything of those depths. And I don't want to belong to a church or a fellowship that knows those depths. I want the Holy Spirit to take me into the deep things of God. I want to be filled with Him. Lord, grant my desire this morning. And not just for myself, I pray for my brothers and sisters, patiently sitting under the sound of your word this morning. Oh, bless us with such an insatiable appetite for yourself to be filled with God. Seal your word home to our hearts this morning. And keep us in that way, the way that is everlasting. For your glory. Amen.